Hello and welcome to Backstage with Gig Performer. My name is Brett Pontecorvo. We're here every Thursday. If you are in the live stream right now, go ahead and let us know. Say hello. Uh, we're so happy to have you all with us week after week. And we have been we've been going for a long time. I was looking through all of the live episodes and I was kind of like, oh man, there's there's quite a, quite a lot of them. So um, today we have an extremely exciting episode. Um, we've got Harvey Jones joining us. Um, and I'm going to let him summarize his career, but he has played in so many awesome projects and is deeply connected um, with David and Jerry Murata and some of the other people who really help Gig Performer run. Um, so we're excited to have him. We're also going to be taking a look at a performance he did um, a couple of years back, I guess. Time goes quickly. It might have been 2020 when this was recorded or 2021. I can't remember, but... Um, we're going to be taking a look at an actual concert, some clips of a live concert that Harvey played um, with some other exceptional musicians um, using Gig Performer and some of the tools he was using to create um, soundscapes and, of course, all hosted live within uh, Gig Performer, which is pretty cool. Um, welcome, Wire Noises. Thank you so much for popping in. Um so we're going to have a look at all of these things today. Um, and if you have any questions at any point, um, feel free to put them in and I'll prompt you guys for all of that type of stuff. But thanks for so much for being with us. Uh, and I'm going to welcome to the backstage stream right now, Mr. Harvey Jones. How's it going, Harvey? It's going good. It's going <laughs> good. Can I be seen and heard with my Doctor Who background here? <laughs> Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Yeah. I love it. Um so first of all, thanks so much for your time and for being with us. Um, it's it's an honor to have you here. Um, for those who might be watching right now who don't know anything about your career, about your life, about what you do, can you briefly bring us up to speed? Oh, crikey. <laughs> <laughs> Were you prepared for that question? <laughs> no, and I should have been. Um, <laughs> about my life and career. Let's leave the life out of it. I don't want to... You traumatize anyone <laughs> but um i've had a great time with synthesizers since i was quite young not as young as the people who get to play with them now um mm -hmm. but god sum it up okay i gained access to music through the british brass band movement in the school system mm. as a, a cornet player um i didn't know that that's really awesome yeah that was my that was my way in. Okay. Um, at the age of eleven, and I had a fantastic teacher, a uh, salvation a salvationist a man who had a great effect on my life, Eddie Granger. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, this kind of uh, chaotic kid suddenly given a cornet, which is like a trumpet, um, kind of channeled all that, and I practiced my ass off and got good. And then at 14, I called a family meeting and said, look, we have extravagant Christmases. We go on holiday every year. This has got to stop and you've got to get me a piano because I can only play one note at a time on the cornet and I want to write and I'm listening to Emerson, Lake and Palmer, you know, all day. Yeah. And uh, it's a long story, but eventually a piano showed up. And then I went to music college with trumpet as my major and piano was my second. Okay. Um, and then as soon as college ended, I pretty much put the trumpet down and started buying gear, Fox Continental, Fender Rhodes piano, ARPX synthesizer. What a what a what a rotten yeah. place to start! But okay. Uh, <laughs> and then you know various bands in the UK, and then I moved to. New York in 1987. I didn't know I was moving. I came to work on a project with Jerry that was maybe going to take a couple of three months and that turned into three years. And by then I was clearly not going back to the UK. Wow. And then, you know, through the kindness and, and um, the grace of a bunch of people, I was playing on records and gained a reputation as I actually, my career, career my activities started where I was, um, called in by a lot of really good bands, jazz groups, some big names, Carla Blay, Steve Swallow, 
because they given all this they were in Dorsey of uh you know Korg and Yamaha and stuff and they didn't know how to use it jazz musicians aren't really interested in the technology or at least that's a very that's a very broad statement sure but anyway there was this weird guy from England who who you know could come in and understand the music and and, pro, and program the appropriate parts and that was that was a good leg into the scene and then you know I'm I'm missing out years of depravity and, and you know and all of that but I uh, <laughs> I was involved in a, a a big hit record with an old friend of mine Donna Lewis mm -hmm. um, and I played a lot on the album and a little bit on the single but that got me a little bit of attention and we and we toured that record for three years and kind of overlapping with that I was Chris Boti's keyboard player for eleven years. Mm -hmm. Chris Boti is a trumpet player, mm -hmm. fantastic trumpet player. And that was an interesting time because it was it's technically it's smooth jazz and sure. I I have no business playing jazz. And I said this to Chris when he was hiring me. I said, Chris, you know, this is this is jazz. He says, I'm hiring you because you're not a jazz musician. And he was a big pop fan. And he said, I want some of those elements. I want the crazy electronic sounds. I want to use sequences and loops and stuff. And I want to do something different within the format. God bless him for that. Interesting. And we worked that for 11 years and it was, it was great fun. So he hired you. Sorry, you know, I, I just hit the note with my stunt. Uh, it's, it's all right. So he hired you, you know, for the skills that you did have. Exactly. I, I like love that because it's not sometimes it's not always just like you know the things you can't do right like musicians you get so stuck in your head you're like I don't have this skill or this skill or this skill but right. you know you his, got the vision, his vision was to bring his you know jazz chops into a more pop area but a hip pop area with you know influences of new wave and electro mm -hmm. and once he gave me that kind of green light you know, it was uh, it was a lot of fun. He had plenty of people who could play chords with phone numbers after them and solo for an hour and and all of that. And he 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 wanted like a textural guy who could kind of be an onstage producer somewhere between a, you know a DJ and a player. I can play. I'm not saying that. Sure. But I wasn't in that style, so I would just do what I heard mm -hmm. um, over these tunes and the. The key band, which was which was present for the like the middle golden period of that, was Joe Bonadio on drums, incredible. Mm -hmm. John Osmond on bass, Mark Schulman and Shane Fontaine on guitars. Wow. Chris on trumpet, and me droning away on a Prophet Five. It was uh, it was awesome, and um, and we really worked that. I produced one of these records. Um, great record called slowing down the world it quickly became known as slowing down the sales and <laughs> <laughs> but that was a golden peak period and and you know it was uh formative shall we say yeah for sure so you were playing just on a profit were you using like other external stuff alongside oh, it or oh, at, at, at the beginning i had a yamaha tx816 mm -hmm. Rack. I was big into FM in the nineties. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Prophet, um, Kurzweil of some sort. It would depend on where we were going and what the budget was. Eventually, I was told politely after America West destroyed my eight sixteen rack that they weren't going to replace it. And you know, mm. but you know, it was just it. But yeah. I kept away semi religiously from the digital digital electric piano you know with string pad stuff that is all over that genre right and i you know chris was very blunt with me he says you, you know we're not here to fit in he said you know be your freaky self and you know and we would do long orchestral ramblings and and stuff and it was different every night so it you know, it was jazz in that sense <laughs> And there was enough jazz in there for for him to not lose his audience, but it was sonically pretty unique, not just due to me, but to the whole attitude. Everyone in the band was a huge Peter Gabriel fan, mm -hmm. and, and Blue Nile fan, and U2, and all of that. So we, you know, we, 
coming from a different kind of set of information than most of our contemporaries at that time. Yeah. You know, I think people forget to, um, you know, when bebop started to come around, mm-hmm. uh, those guys were breaking from the scene. Like, right, exactly. And, you know, it sort of become like, you know, frozen in time, this like concept of like real jazz. And oh. I guess I'm a little bit biased too with like having a lot of jazz in my background, but yeah. it was really these guys who were coming in and looking at jazz and being like, you know, wouldn't it be cool if we did this? <laughs> which then changed everything. So it's almost like I'm hearing these stories and I'm like, Oh, this is the continued evolution of musicians right. bringing their own background to an improvisational style. Um, exactly. You can play jazz or you can upset it, you know, and Chris was at that time determined to upset it. You know, it was, it was, um, yeah. I also have to steal from you because you said <laughs> it's something to the effect of having, um, Lots of musicians who could play chords with phone numbers after them. Yeah. yeah. Never heard that before. Oh. <laughs> yeah, that's so good. I mean, I would uh, listen to conversations on the bus and in green rooms, and I would think I'd gone into a parallel universe. Uh, you know, no disrespect or patronize. I, I, you know, I got to see some great show. I mean, you know, it was 11 years of work, studio, live, hospital, you know. Yeah. <laughs> um. <laughs> AJ, um, who wears a lot of different hats but helps gig performer immensely, has written in a question here. Did you do the promo tour? Yeah, for- I did. Okay. There you go. There you go. Um, all right. Fantastic. So you've played a lot of music. You've had some really cool experiences. How did you end up moving from being somebody who's using these hardware synths to being somebody who uses gig performer. Why did that happen? How did that happen? Well, <laughs> you know, if, if you're, if you want to work in New York and, and, you know, and do a few gigs a week with different artists, you, you, you're going to collapse pretty soon. If you're carrying hardware around. I agree with you. Not everybody does, but I'm like, I don't want to bring more than a laptop and an interface. Well, here's uh, the thing. I didn't want to compromise the Sonics, so I didn't want to go around with a ghastly red instrument sure. that kind of got a third of the way to a bunch of stuff and all of the way to nothing. <laughs> so, so... Can I quit you on that one later? Oh, Sorry. yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, you know, as soon as soft synth started to be viable, I did, and I came, you know... Obviously, I heard of Gig Performer because I've been working with David as as his assist in programming some sounds. We'll get back to that. Mm -hmm. But um, as soon as I could just take – and I was a prick, you know. I was the same as everyone else saying I was using a computer, you know. Get over it, you know. It's it's like you're there to make polyphony and color however you choose to and – you know, I could go. I could go to gigs on my bicycle with my laptop in my backpack, as opposed to spending a hundred dollars in cabs and trying to cajole a friend to help me with my gear. <laughs> so you know, bit of a no-brainer. And you know, I'm a big Profit Five guy, and um, I think the first who did the first Profit Five. I've got the Yuhi one now, which is gorgeous. I'm trying to think who. It, I'm so sorry. Are you talking about who did the first VST version? Yeah, yeah. It was um, – anyway, it was very good. Okay. Whatever it was. And then it must be 10 years ago now um, that I came across a device by Blue Cat Audio, who are a great company. I won't talk too much about but they're not competitors at all. They just made an, a, a rack, a VST rack called Patchworks. And I was, I was dancing a sailor's jig on, on, uh, on 34th Street because it meant I could load up two or three Profit Fives and a tape echo simulator just on a laptop and set ranges and splits and layers and all of that. And I'm like, oh, this is this is cool. 
Patchworks was not anything like gig performing. It was really just a rack that you could load a bunch of VS. It had no MIDI capabilities beyond, you know, MIDI in. Um, but that's, I have to be honest, that's what got me into using soft synths. And as the soft synths got better and, and all of that, it was a no-brainer when um, gig performer... I actually re resisted for a little while <laughs> until eventually David said, you know, I'm not putting up with this. You got to have gig performers. <laughs> so did, were you like a version one gig performer user? No, like no, I, no, I didn't come in until three. That's how long I held out. Wow. Because, because I'm, I'm, I'm lazy. Um, it's been a long or you're, time. Or you're just efficient. You want to get the results as quickly as possible. I, anyway. don't want, I don't want my life to be like a university course where I'm constantly downloading this update and, and studying and that. I want to play music. Right. And 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 to to a lot of people, probably including David's um, frustration, when I've got something that's working and I can express myself, I'm not interested in the better version of it. Because I'm not a better version of me. So I haven't been updated. So I'm not going to update my tools either. It's a ridiculous <laughs> proposition. Sure. Um, but but that's kind of driving it. You know, this last winter working with my musical partner in Wales, Gary Hughes, we were both lamenting on the amount of, on the kind of pie chart of creating music or running your gear you know, you've got to keep that in the right um, relation, yeah. you know, and, it, and it's easy to keep on top of your gear. Oh, I would write a song, except I should download these latest blah, blah, blahs, and oh, that's not working and all of that. And a lot of time, I think it's a subconscious way of avoiding the real challenges of creativity. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll just work on the rig. I'll work on the rig, and then I won't have to find a good chord. Yes. It's, uh, you know, they're like, concepts or the language i've like started to use in my own head is like is this a tool for tool sake like is this yeah. just well put. for the sake of mastering the tool as opposed to a tool for getting the job done yeah and, and then, you know the amount of guys will look over your shoulder and say oh you know they 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 enhanced that in version six and and all of that and you know to repeat myself well i haven't been enhanced and i'm hearing what i want to hear you know, right. I'll only go so far and I am going to move up to Gig Performer 4 mm -hmm. uh, very soon. But in terms of soft synths, you know, I could I could say, and I have said, <laughs> oh, soft synths are terrible. Uh, you know, it's not the real experience. It, it's true. There's nothing like being in a studio, moving the mouse and all of that stuff. You know, it's hard to discover things by accident because every mouse move is intentional, mm. which is, in a way, is a limitation when you've got Prophet 5 or Jupiter 8 or Oberheim Expander, or whatever it is you're using, and the knobs and switches are in front of you. It's a, obviously, I'm stating the obvious, it's much more tactile. Right. But you can also hit the wrong button and say, <laughs> oh, yeah. That's cool, <laughs> and go yeah. down and go down that route. So a little bit of chance. There's more chance. Um, our good friend, chance. There's more chance when you're using hardware. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, yeah. I think I, I've used hardware I, for long enough, faithfully, to bring those skills to the software. You know, and when mm -hmm. Yuhi came out with their Profit Five, the Repro. Um, the Repro One and Profit Five, which are bundled together, they're exquisite. Uh, that guy's a genius. He got he got everything right, he, you know, including offsets. You can open the lid. You know, there's calibrations on on those instruments, the Pro One and the Pro Five, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and you can you can adjust them. You can uncalibrate the instrument. You can calibrate it incorrectly, right. so it's it's more like your favorite Profit. I'm saying profit, 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 because that's my thing. That's like my Telecaster. Yeah, yeah. Um, but once you know, once I once I'd had a you know a couple of years of of uh, of doing that, you know, no one needs me to tell them the Arturia stuff and lots of other stuff. And Contact even has great synthesizers now, which we'll maybe talk about. But it's um, 
I, I still use hardware when we're making a making a real record. Yeah. Um, but boy, is the software great for getting the ideas going? I've demoed stuff in software, and you know, we've said, okay, so we'll we'll replace this. Gary has a Moog one, which is delightful, and it was like, shall we spend a day recreating this on, or, or, or does it sound good, and we'll put it through a tube preamp, and 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 we'll be okay. So, yeah, I'm schizophrenic and Libran, so there I am in the middle. Hardware is great, software is great too. The I, you know. The job is to make music loud. The job is to make music. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> it's like we can end the stream right there. Everybody go home and make something. Um, <laughs> yes, absolutely. So I'm like, there's so much going on in there. Both things have their place. But if you created a record on your hardware and you were then touring, you would take software with you. Unless there was a budget that there will never be. <laughs> okay, sure. You know, um, so I do want to show a clip of. Uh, I do. I do want to say one pompous thing before we get to the clip. Please, well, and actually, I wasn't even going to get to the clip yet. But tell okay. me your pompous thing. <laughs> I th I think you do better with soft sense if you've got a hardware sense to work out on. Mm -hmm. um, you know, a soft sense is very controlled, and like, like I say, the chance element isn't there. And don't give me a dice icon and say you yeah, randomize. You know that's 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 not what I'm talking about. I'm I'm talking like where you're going after a goal on hardware, and on the way to that, you find something else that you weren't really looking for. That's either better or more unique, or you know more more surprising. So, you know, just because we're using software, I mean, you know, it, it, it's a software suite that we we're using with hardware. We'd all have to sell our houses, you know. It, it, it's <laughs> yeah, it's true. Good, but have one good. I'm not here to give anyone advice. I'm in no position. But have one good, challenging, analog hardware synthesizer in your rig, even if it only stimulates and kind of teaches you, you know, the interaction process. Because yeah. it's that thing. It's that thing with the mouse. Now I'm adjusting the square way. You know. Now I'm doing this, and now I'm going to do that. It's so intentional. Right. Yeah, and you also kind of have to figure out really where things are at. Like, even starting from, like, a preset sound is a very different experience on a hardware synth versus on a software synth. Yeah. Um, you know, you really get the kind of... When you're doing something on a synthesizer... It feels like you're actually doing it. <laughs> it's a it's a different, totally different vibe. It's a much uh, more friendly experience. I won't get vulgar, but 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 software is like is like having having a condom made of wood, as opposed to <laughs> as opposed to <laughs> making love in a forest. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to quote you on that one too. Um, uh oh, <laughs> it looks like. <laughs> Um, it looks like AJ maybe filmed your show, unbeknownst. Um, well, and I know AJ. How did that happen? There you go. Cool. Um, okay. Hi, AJ. Thank you for all your fantastic efforts up in Woodstock. There, it was a great time. It was. Yeah. It was June. I know it was June 2021 because my last gig performer file was created on on that day for that show called ah. called Dreamland. Dreamland 6. So it, it was around June 2021. And I was surprised when I saw that. I thought it was just last year. but Yeah. It wasn't. Um, it's, it, it goes time is so, uh, so fast. So you, you've, you built this setup for this particular show. Can you talk a little bit about what is stream of consciousness? Like what was the concept behind it? And then maybe we can look at the clip a bit. Well, I'm very close with Jerry musically and personally. And, you know, when I came to America because of a project that he was stewarding. And then uh, we worked together on many, many, many things. Um, Jerry was and still is pr producing. And I became his go-to guy, not for, not for everything, but for the kind of indie singer, songwriter stuff, looking for something different. Jerry, you know, got me 
involved in that and was very loyal and supportive. And, uh, you know, we stayed in touch. I, I moved from Woodstock into the city and, you know, doing other things, both of us. But he, it, the concept behind the group was Jerry called me up and says, you want to come up and play? And I said, yeah. <laughs> so I went on play. I met Arjun, who's a fantastic musician. Extremely impressive. I was listening. I, I don't like to give it away, but I was listening to him playing, and I was like, oh, man. This oh, guy it, is real deal. It, it, it was incredible. You know, the, a friend of mine who I was describing it to before it happened says, oh, you're going to have a blast because you're the only, you know, it's two drummers and you. So you can do anything you want. Not not true. The amount of melodies and chords that are coming out of Jerry's rig and Arjun's rig because of who they are and what they're playing. Um, you know, I did some sneaky investigations on what tones were, you know, what the what the keys available were. But they're very you know, incredibly symphonic, melodic players and um wasn't a lot of talking there wasn't a lot of shall we do this shall we do that quickly set up in a in a you know the great environment at dreamland where we could see and hear each other mm -hmm. and and we just played and we just you know we played for a couple of three days and recorded all of it mm -hmm. and then we did the concert and did about 20 percent of what we'd rehearsed and and the the rest was just improvised which you know we'd always hoped it would be like that but you know, when you're really listening and concentrating and you can trust those around you that they won't, you know, that they're not there for any other reason than to, you know, we're helping one another. It was great. It was one of the one of the better musical experiences I can I can look back on. And, you know, as as much of that is to do with the, you know, the people and the personalities than the skill level. Yeah. Yeah. There is something magic about playing with people where you're like you like know them musically. There's yeah. something that is intangibly irreplaceable about that experience of, I have played a lot of music with you. And so I know what's about to happen or I yeah. right. know the questions you're going to be asking, or I know sure. the places you want to go. Um, there's a guy I play with a lot. He's a guitar player. And, um, I I was chatting with him recently, actually chatting to a bunch of people kind of just a, about playing music. And I was explaining that for the most part, I'm usually just watching his shoulder the whole show because depending on what he's doing with his body, I know where he's going next. And I'm not even sure he knows what he's doing, you know? Right. Well, it, but, it, there is like a kinetic connection when you're, you know, when yeah. your concentration and, and trust level is high. Can I tell you a funny anecdote? Please, please. I, 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 I a, she's passed away now. Gabrielle Ruth. Gabrielle Ruth and the Mirrors was a fantastic. Um, she was a like a, a dance master, and she mm. would have these kind of like rave like sessions where you know, not like a rave, but where people would go. Her husband Robert Ansel had the band The Mirrors, and it was Gabrielle Roth in The Mirrors, and I played on several records, and we became close. Anyway, there was one big concert at the, at the Marriott in Times Square, and just with a couple of days' notice, he says, um, come and play, you know, and we'll do this. And there's like 500 people there, and it's a big celebration, you know, people from, you know, 7 to 70 and all of this. And Gabrielle would lead the dance, and we would do, you know, various rhythmic excursions and and stuff like that and i'm setting up you know there's no rehearsal people don't rehearse in new york it's a real drag <laughs> such a drag you know i'm sure you found that oh no we're not going to rehearse it's part of the work motherfucker. are you sure <laughs> <laughs> it's a question well, i've asked before i'm sitting up on stage and i says robert have you uh, uh, have you got any maps anything so i know what might be Happening next, he said, watch Gabrielle's ass. <laughs> and you'll know what to do. When you were talking about your friend and you watching his shoulder, it's, you know, it's the same thing. Yes. Great yes. show, by the way. And RIP Gabrielle. And Robert since passed as well. Robert passed last year. Uh, yeah. But I'd like to recommend, I'm not going to turn this into an infomercial, but um, 
Gabrielle Ruth and the Mirrors, particularly the record um, Tribe. There's, yeah. It's really good stuff. Yeah. Um, I once held a rehearsal mm. <laughs> um, in some like very small park, which probably has a name, outside of a bar on the Lower East Side. I was doing a show. It was, at the time, running Ableton. Uh, it was an it was playing keyboard and Ableton push. And then it was guitar and computer. And I say that because the computer was very much its own instrument. Okay. And four horn players, a drummer and a bassist and a cello player. And all the charts were written up and I'm standing outside. It's like 10 PM in this park. And we're like, you know, cell phone batteries on the charts. <laughs> Walking through the part I that I to get I wrong. Know. Oh gosh! Anyway, it's part of the fun. So, all right, how, do you get a, how do you get a four-piece horn section to stay in tune? I don't know. How do you do it? Shoot three of them. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Gosh, no, it's okay. Um, I. Uh, you're bringing out all the anecdotes in me. I was good friends with a high school band teacher and uh, he tells stories of teaching elementary school band. And at the end of his concerts, which he would just describe as being the worst sound ever mm -hmm. uh, that he's ever heard, he would turn around and say to the parents, these are your kids. <laughs> but he would applaud and go crazy, you know, <laughs> anyway, <laughs> horn players staying in tune. All right. Uh, I want to show this video clip and then I want to talk about, well, two things we have to make sure. So first of all, stream of consciousness, there's a link in the description to the full version of this concert. Um, it's hosted on Jerry Murata's channel. Um, so if you're inspired by what's going on here, um, go listen to it. And if you're not inspired by it, go listen to it anyway, because it means you've missed something. Um, and it's, it's really interesting especially if you watch the way all of the musicians are watching each other. Um, there's go just, just go watch and study. Um, even if you can't get through the whole thing, I think it's worthwhile. Um, and I want to talk about your gig performer setup, mm -hmm. um, which is on gig performer three, but we'll forgive you for that for now. And um, <laughs> you're talking like I'm driving a Dodge Dart or something. <laughs> and also we need to talk about the, um, Delia Derbyshire Society, but yeah. I don't want to jump down. We need to make sure we talk about those things. So All right. let me get up here. Um, Harvey, you're not going to be on the screen, but I will be able to hear you. So okay. if you want to say something or are trying to, you know, want to point something out, I can pause the video and whatever. But um, can okay. I talk over it so we don't have to pause if I do have yeah. a comment to make? Absolutely. Uh, There's not much to say except I'll pre warn our listeners. You got to watch the dog Beulah at the at the very beginning. I hope it's still in the clip, Brett. The, the dog? Yeah. Be yeah, it's still in the clip. Beulah. It's still still in the clip. All right. Um, here we go. Thank you. 
All right, Harvey, can we hear you? Yeah, can you? I can. It's uh, it's very relieving to hear your, hear your voice. So, <laughs> um, okay. So tell me and the people who are watching, what is happening for you in in this moment? Like you're you're creating sound. <laughs> I that's I guess a bit of an understatement, but like you're using these synthesizers to create something that it's it's a sound. Like I, I couldn't necessarily attribute it to an a specific instrument. You're like creating something that blends with the drums that's kind of making making like glue it's pulling everything together what's happening for you in your mind when when this is all going on um <clears throat> well it was turned it into a therapy session pretty quickly didn't it um <laughs> i've well in gig performer i've got a couple of my favorite synthesizers and a lot of delays okay and pitch shifters okay um and significantly, I think nothing is synced to tempo. Mm. Um, so it's you know, but it, it's so it's kind of moving as a different relationship, you know, depending on waves of stuff. And um, I've got the trusty Prophet Five there. So if if all else, you know, if there's any technical stuff, at least I've got an instrument. Mm -hmm. And actually, play. You know, I kind of set it up as a as a little thing maybe a couple of times, but it, it, it was just such great fun to be using the two together. Mm -hmm. um, but on that, on that clip that we just saw, it's really just, I set up this long frippertronic esque Dobby C sharp minor thing. And we kept going. There's a great, there's a, I'm using tape stop from. Uh, Do you have this back space available to look at? Not for that exact, okay, okay, exact show, but you know, it's actually. Let me take a look. Can I switch to gig performer? Yeah, yeah, yeah go ahead. Let me go on the screen. Let's have a look. Yeah, that's just that. Well, let's just talk through like what's happening inside of gig performer. So, for the most part, you're relying on you were mentioning a specific VST that you were using mostly to drive, uh, to drive these sounds. Is this? That's right. it's it's a it's a it's a favorite plugin of mine by uh, Tone Two called Electra. Okay. Um, and we are we live? Are we are we talking to our friends now? Yep. Yep. Okay. Can I can I talk about Electra? I'm sorry, I can't find that that. Um, no, it's okay. Yeah, let's let's talk about Electra. What's what's happening here? Okay. Can you see that? Oh yeah. Okay. Uh, I'll just wax a little bit about it. I'm not going to give a tutorial. I'm not, I'm not an endorsee of the company, but okay. The, the, this is a hundred and sixty dollar VST from Tone Two, a German company. It's been out for a while. They just updated it to version three, and it is my favorite soft synth. Um, what makes it feel? I'm going to specifically. It's you see the panel here? It looks nice, doesn't it? Oh, it's a three, three oscillators. That's nice. Mm -hmm. Very good. Each oscillator you can draw from either a set of wavetables, uh, custom waves, analog, or import your own sample. Okay. Now, and, you know, the usual suspects, two filters, serial or parallel. You can route each oscillator 
to each filter, you know, varying, you know, the same amount, more of one than the other, and all of that stuff, mm -hmm. which, which is all great, but it's not the point. The point is as follows. That's one layer of four. There ah. are four layers that are identical. Mm. Now, that's good. What's the big deal, Have Well, mm -hmm. this is the big deal. You can set an independent key range for each oscillator, mm. which okay. really, you know, coming from a analog slash modular background, it means, of course, you can use that feature to create, you know, splits and layers and blah, blah, blah. But more, more interesting to me is I'll create a sound on one, one layer with the other three turned off. And then I'll copy that layer to the other three. So it's the same on each layer. But then I can go into each one and adjust the key range. So one oscillator actually only appears for an interval of a fourth, say, somewhere in the range. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I can tune that. I can add a little bit of noise to it, a little bit of instability. And I hope I'm explaining it right. It's really. So it, it basically allows you to get some uncertainty for lack there of a better term, like across yeah. the key bed, you're going to get variations when you're moving across the range of your instrument. Yeah, exactly. And like I say, you can use it to do the obvious, which is one sound in this range, one sound in another. But for me, it was more Oberheim like ish to have the same basic tone over over the four layers and then get into the key ranges mm -hmm. with some overlaps. But you know how, you know, in a real synthesizer, for some reason, you know, this note always clicks or cuts out or something. Mm -hmm. or, or like, how come, the, how come the noise is louder on the high A than it is on any of the other notes? You know, so right. you, could, you could do that. Um, it's just a beautiful sounding... Since I think, I think with all the virtual analogs and the things with the virtual patch cables, people are looking for a way to really get into the depths of a sand. And I think this is a simpler way. Yeah. Um, for for me, yes. the fact that you can import a sample. I mean, I've done things where like I've made a complex sound, mm -hmm. and then on one layer, I've used low grade samples of that same sound. Mm -hmm to come in and out on certain registers very quietly. Ah, uh, yes. You see what I, you, you know, it's, it, 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 it's always the quest for, you know, not, like I say, not this kaleidoscopic universe of sonics, but, but you know, kind of one sound that's got a lot of um, abnormalities. That's, that's my bag. Absolutely. Yeah, and that, that kind of makes the sound feel alive. Yeah. Um, where we are right now, time wise, so we're at 56 minutes. If no anybody way. has any questions, we are, I know it goes fast. If anybody has any questions for Harvey that you want to put in the comments, please do so. Um, Harvey, I wanted to ask, um, well, first of all, is there anything in gig performer that we've missed uh, uh, in particular to this concert that you wanted to showcase? No, it was great. I mean, I was able to, you know, Tweak stuff. I was able to play files. We did one choir piece later on in the concert. It just wasn't practical to reproduce that choir piece that I had written. And I was able to just very simply, you know, have it there, play mm -hmm. my uh, VSTs around it. Mm -hmm. um, and it was solidly stable. Um, mm -hmm. Can I okay. talk about one other device? Please, yes. This is free. Look, I'm not pretending, you know, that other people don't know about this, but this has also been a, a boon to me. Mm, this okay. is a thing by TB Audio called the Isolate. Can you see it? Have they got it there? Yep. It's really a mastering device, enabling you to solo and mute five frequency bands which you can set. Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. what's the big deal? So let me take a sound, that same sound. That's nice. But if I solo just the middle frequencies. Yeah. 
have like a beautifully lo-fi version of that or just the low mids or those two together maybe just the high mids no nope, nothing going on there so yes and it's 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 you know, you've worked on the sound, you think it's great. What what about you suddenly, for whatever reason, take all of the low mids and, and, and low frequencies out? Mm -hmm. Is it still working in the track? I use this in mixing and recording um, to just – you can do this with any EQ. This is just free and fast. It really enables you to uh, – uh, get some some insight into the sound that you're using or or sculpting that's to me inspiring yes um, yeah and it also like the layout feels like i know what to do yeah yeah it's kind of it, it's and that's always a good feeling isn't it <laughs> so you can go from now that's it bypassed and yes it's a lovely sound but this is also lovely and just might, it has all the character, but it just might sit a little better in your track without those low frequencies or low mids that are fighting other things. Yes. To yes. be used with discretion, but, you know, just a tip to my friends, a favorite and free ally. Yes. And God knows we need as many of those as we can get. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay. So a couple of things I want to, let viewers know about so first of all the full version of the concert <clears throat> that we just showed a clip from is in the description right now so if you want to check it out you can click that link second of all um can you give us harvey just a brief summary <laughs> um of your your current project or one of your current projects uh the dahlia derbyshire uh appreciation society am i getting all of that right and also, can you toggle back to... Um, yes, Chrome. Yeah. Okay, I can hear you now. Go ahead. Um, manful try, Brett. Um, <laughs> it's, it's Delia Derbyshire. There we go. Delia Derbyshire Appreciation Society is my, my main thing with my longtime friend, um, Gary Hughes, um, a very well-known and productive keyboard player he would yell at me if i gave you his cv he's a very modest man but <laughs> he's done some incredible stuff and after you know a lifetime of of being the side man and you know bending our right there you go bending our ideas um rightfully so to you know the the artist at hand we just said you know we're we're in our 60s now um let's uh Let's make the synth record. And we declared, we, you know, could go in a lot of directions, but we declared no beats and no vocals. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And let's just, there's Gary, look at him. There we go. And then, um, and, we've, and we've had a blast doing that. Gary has, um, at an undisclosable location in Wales, a, a fine studio with lots of, you know, the Moog Modulus, CS80, uh, vcs 3s stuff and mm -hmm. that's all hardware and mm -hmm. i you know i'm i'm frowned at if i pull out the computer you know it's <laughs> it's sure sure for a project like this though yeah so it's like people can download the music yeah, go to our website daily derbyshire appreciation society.com that's easy to type Mm -hmm. Yeah, very easy. Um, Google oh, does to... correct it though. So, and this is also, by the way, this is in the description, so you don't have to type it. Just go to the description, click the link. Okay, I'll go, I'll go to Six Degrees Records, where our label in San Francisco, um, who were very good to us, have allowed, allowed us to do to do these records. And if you, you know, if you have a liking for Tangerine Dream, Tamita, you know, um that kind of stuff. It's, it's called ambient. It's not because there's chord changes. It's very slow 
kind of pop music. I won't use the word cinematic. We all have to stop saying cinematic. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, so, but but it's 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 instrumental and exotic music of a very elect well, a purely ele electronic source. And there's the two albums. There's the self-titled, and there's uh, Wow and Flutter. Mm -hmm. And our third record, we did this last winter. We're waiting to mix it because we're trying to do it together. Um, and I live in New York, and Gary lives in Wales. But that's you know, if I had to pull out, you know, what are you doing now? That's it. I also want to mention um, I am part of a New York collective called Blow Up Hollywood. Um, I would invite people to look at that. I'm more of a traditional keyboard player in that than a synthesist, but I'm very proud of it. Yeah. Um, and um, Annie Gallup. Um, I've done a couple of three records with her where she just fashions these songs on, on, on guitar and very bravely says, do whatever you want to do with this. Wow. And we have a blast. I've never met her. We've been doing records now for three years. We, <laughs> I have never been in the same room as her. And, you know, I'm the person who gives the lectures about, no, you need to be in the room with the energy. And yet we've done great work together. So it's, you know, all, all of these rules and God knows I've, quoted a bunch of them in this interview they're all yeah. to be taken with you know more than a pinch of salt because if you're getting the results the wrong way then it's the, then that's the right way for that moment context is key in yes. most yes uh, so <clears throat> do check out these projects uh friends who are listening um harvey if you were going to give anybody a tip for getting started with gig performer they're brand new. They've never used the software before. What would you say to them? Uh, don't be scared and just imagine that you're in a room rather like the studio of, of Gary's that we just saw some photographs at. Mm -hmm. It's that exciting. Wow. It doesn't have to be any less than that. You can do anything in gig performer that your mind can imagine. If, and it, if Gig Performer was around in the 90s, I'd have a full head of hair now. <laughs> That's a great endorsement. I love it. It's um, no, no, it's wonderful. The, the speed at which I can load a plug-in, say, set the note range, set the transposition value, put any other effects you know that aren't built into the thing that I want in, you know, I'm not in any, in any hurry, but as a sidebar, it's really fast to get where I want to get. Yes. It means I can take more cigarette breaks. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> um, yeah, there's something to be said for being able to make something a in a timely fashion, you know? Well, um, it's, it's, it's nice to be able to get to the point of inspiration and execution as fast as possible. Yes. Most of the time. Can I ask you a question? Please. Not a complaint. <laughs> well, kind of, halfway. Is, is there ever going to be a plug-in version of Gig Performer? I don't know. David's head just went up. Dave, David, <laughs> I, David, should I pull you on? <laughs> um, you know, oh, we can... Only, David, only because when I've spent, you know, half a day making the best sound in the world indisputably... And then six weeks later, I'm doing a recording project, and I want to use that sound quickly. Very easy. You just route it to your door with Black Hole. Ah, well, now I have Black Hole. Can I sequence it? You can. You what, uh, There's actually a blog article on that topic. And what you can do, and I do this for recording as well, so I'll create my sounds with Gig Performer, complete with uh, automation and changing rack spaces if they're part of the sound. Uh -huh. There you go. Oh, he's um, there. It's the uh, back. Yeah. And, and then basically what I do, uh, on, you can do it on a Mac without anything. And on Windows, you need to add uh, a virtual cable to, to route uh, audio and MIDI. But um, basically what you can do, and it's really easy, is, is basically you can drive Gig Performer from your sequencer, from your door. Yeah. In other words, you put MIDI on the tracks and route the MIDI to uh, via IAC, you know, uh, Apple's um, internal MIDI, right into Geek Performer. 
And then you can route the audio from Geek Performer via Black Hole right back to tracks in, in Logic Pro or any other door. And also, Gig Performer works really well as an instrument. Yeah. It, it does a lot of things. Yeah. And I don't want to limit it to being one thing. But having the routing the way... There's a blog article. It's very good. This is what I do, David, when, when I need to record something, what you're saying. It, it keeps you playing an instrument as opposed to you playing a semi-instrument. Anyway, that's a... <laughs> yeah, there's a whole philosophical discussion about... Where, where, what's Geek Performer's role in, in the world? And we view it, and, and Steve Turnbridge was the first to make the observation, this is part of the musician, it's not part of the recording engineer. And I know these days a lot of people have to do both. But right. basically, when you want to go to the recording, turn on your recording with your channel strips and all your other stuff, and you do that. But basically, when you're performing, you're on the gig performer side, and they're like, it's two separate pieces, just like it I is think always being in the recording studio. And I that's really the philosophy, of, which is I where think that's, a, that's, that's an important ob observation, because a lot of us, we're performing and engineering and producing all at the same time, and they are different jobs. They're and very I, different, and they need to be treated differently. And gig performer kind of forces you to do that. Yeah. You focus on making your sounds then, okay, I've got all my sounds. Now let me focus on recording, and I'm not touching Gig Performer anymore. It's just, it's just, it's like my pedal board if I'm a guitarist. Yeah, guitarist, yeah, absolutely. Right? Yeah, so that, you know, that's that's the model we've been after, and that's really um, partly why we haven't really focused too much on, on, on the plug-in side of things. There'd be a lot of restrictions on what you could do once you go to a plug-in. That, that's <laughs> our model. It's a great creative experience. And for me to be able to just let my twisted imagination literally go, not have to plead with any hardware or, 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 you know, or capabilities, I can literally dream something up and Geek Performer will do it for me. Yeah. And then be, before I know it, I'm writing. Yeah. It, and, and that's the point. It lets you, and this was my goal uh, as a performing musician is it lets you focus on being a musician and you don't have to deal with having a PhD in mix engineering. So wire this to this and off you go. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Nice. Yeah. That, yes. That's really where we're coming from. Yes. Um, well, thanks for popping in, David. Harvey, yeah. thank you for being with us. Um, Didn't get any questions. Have I scared people away? Um, it seems like... We didn't get a ton of questions, but that's okay. People probably said not, not we don't always. Um, I think it's probably be, because all of my observations are, are irrefutable. That's exactly that it. Yeah. That must um, be it. Thank you for being here and for sharing. Uh, thank for you. Sharing today. Um, for those who are watching, next week we'll be back talking all about gig performer extensions. Um, so Harvey, you can update all of your stuff, update yourself, update to Geek Performer 4 and get on the extension train. I know you're excited about it. No. Nope. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but actually we're going to be talking about, you know, how you can make Geek Performer interact more directly with certain pieces of hardware. And actually that's, that's even a limit. That's even a smaller version of what it is. Um, you want to read more about it. I'll link below. Um, an article all about what gig performer extensions are, so you can kind of get the vibe before we go live. Um, Harvey, thanks for being with us, and we'll see you all next week. It's a blast. Thursday, 30.